Chapter 9 of the Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter 9 The Mean Trick of the Timber Cruisers. A landslide exclaimed Giraffe, and he sat up and began twisting his long neck around as though doubtful whether he should dodge to the right or to the left, since it was difficult to locate the direction whence the furious bracket seemed to come. Better say an earthquake, Stephen managed to articulate, though he was shaking all over with the excitement that he would hardly have recognized his own voice. Kind of feel the old ground shaking. Listen, would you? To that smash must be volcanoes around here. Keep still and listen, said Thad, in a tone of authority which both the talkers recognized as belonging to the scoutmaster rather than their chum Thad. So they held their tongues and strained their ears to listen. There was no trouble in hearing, for the racket still kept up. There were heavy thuds, crashes, and a breaking of bushes. No wonder the scouts were mystified. No wonder one thought it a landslide, while another believed some supposed extinct volcano had burst into action again, and that the rain of stones that followed produced these weird sounds. All at once the racket stopped just as suddenly as though a command had been given to cease fire. Well, I declare, if that ain't funny now, remarked Stephen, but because of the order from silence which Thad had issued, he dared not breathe a word above a whisper. Hark, said Alan. That sounded like a horse laugh. The boys crouched there and strained their ears to hear more. Once or twice they thought they caught vague sounds. It was as if someone might be moving along the rocky elevation that formed one side of their nearby little basin in which they had made their small fire and finished their once interrupted dinner. But the sounds were moving further away, as though the Unknown parties might be retreating. Then silence, deep and profound, brooded over the immediate vicinity of the spot where the four startled scouts say, May we talk now, Thad? asked Draft. Yes, but let it be in a low voice, replied the patrol leader. Jerusalem, exclaimed Stephen, just as though he had to let the pent-up steam escape one way or the other, and it took the form of this expression. "'What does it all mean?' asked Stephen, plainly confused and unable to clearly grasp the truth. "'I think I know,' remarked Thad. "'Then tell us, please, quickly,' asked Draft. "'Sounded like a laugh to me. "'Just what it was, too,' Thad went on. "'But who'd want to act funny when all that racket was going on, Thad?' "'Continued Draft, who seemed unusually thick-headed just then possibly on account of being aroused in such a startling manner. The men who made all that row, replied the scoutmaster, men who made the row, great governor, do you mean these rowdies, Hank and Pierre, bursted out giraffe? None other, said Tad, positively. They must have located our little fire in some way, and suppose that we were sleeping close by, so they crept up along that side of the bare ridge where the stones are so thick and just started to heave a few dozen down. That's why it sounded like thunder and hail combined. Those cowards, hissed Draft, whose honest blood seemed to boil with indignation. The sneaks afraid to face four boys because they believed we could shoot some. They had to crawl around the back door and play a trick that you'd think would be about the size of the meanest boy in our hometown of Cranford. They laughed over it, too, burst out Stephen, almost as angry as his long-legged chum. And that shows what kind of fellows they are. Well, altogether, it was lucky escape for us, remarked Alan. That's what, added Giraffe, and we owe a heap to Thad's long head. Never sleep when you eat. That was a pretty good rule for the old hunter to have when painted engines were all around, and by George it seems to be all right even in these modern times. Wow, just think what a time we'd have, observed Stephen, if we'd been sleeping there just as sweetly as, as the babes in the woods. And all of a sudden them rocks began to smash around us. 
I can see the whole blessed outfit scrambling in the dark, trying to get behind trees and yet knowing which side of the trunk was the safe side. Stefan actually chuckled a little as though a gleam of humor had begun to light up the serious nature of the situation. It was a game just in keeping with such a precious pair of rascals, declared Thad. They might have injured some of us badly, and that was just what they hoped to do. Perhaps killed us in the bargain, Alan added. Some of the rocks they heaved into that little basin were just fierce. They came down like cannonballs. It was like what Rip Van Winkle heard when the little old men of the Catskills were playing ten pins with big rocks. But Thad, remarked Giraffe, when they get to thinking it over, do you reckon now they'll guess they didn't do any damage? Just what was in my mind, replied the leader of the patrol. They must know that even men would have yelled and shown all sorts of excitement when bombarded in that way. But let them think what they please. I hope they'll never cross our trail again. I second the wish, said Alan. That's where I differ from you, declared the aroused giraffe. I'd just like to pay the cowards back for that dirty trick. And I will, too, if the chance ever comes along. I'm only bothering about one thing, observed Stefan. And what's that? Thad inquired. What if they run across our innocent chum, poor old Bumpus? Stefan went on to say why. He's so confiding and so straight himself that he couldn't believe wrong of anybody. Why, they'd rob him of his gun and everything else that he had, and then turn him loose like that in the big timber. Oh, I hope they just don't find Bumpus before we get to him. It would be a shame. It's like taking candy from the baby, added Giraffe. Well, let's go to sleep again. We'll talk it over in the morning, suggested Thad. Don't believe I can sleep another wink, declared Stefan. But in spite of his gloomy prophecy, he did drop off again soon after stretching himself out on the ground in the softest spot he could find. and knew nothing more until someone shook him. Looking up, Stefan discovered that the dawn was stealing through the timber, and that Thad bent over him. The other two were already. Giraffe was busy himself, as usual, in getting a little fire under way, for Thad had given it as his opinion that after playing such a dastardly mean trick, Hank and Pierre, the lawless timber cruisers, would not feel like venturing over in the quarter again, lest they be greeted with a warm fire from the guns of the boys. All the scouts felt more or less chilled, as the early morning air was pretty cool, and consequently the fire proved acceptable. As they munched their breakfast, Thad announced that he had found the trail of Bumpus again. This meant that when they were ready to start out, there would be little delay. Of course, pretty much all the talk was about the event of the preceding night and the fortunes of their lost comrade. When I shut my eyes, said Giraffe, I can see that blessed innocent walking around these woods, a whistling for his bear to come out and be shot. And I'm a wondering, remarked Stefan, whether Bumpus, if he does run across a cinnamon bear, just through the luck Greenhorn seemed to have, will climb his tree first and then begin shooting, or just bang away like he did before and make for a tree afterwards. Oh, well, I guess Bumpus learned his little lesson that time, all right, declared Giraffe with the superior air of one who had already gotten his bear and could afford to look down on those not so fortunate. He was scared, good and hard, Stefan went on. Why, his face looked like pie paste, and his Google eyes fairly stood out of his head when he couldn't get up that tree with the old grizzly a-coming for him, growling and chomping his teeth. Thad only smiled as he heard these remarks that had an undercurrent vein of condescending pity for the tenderfoot chum if he remembered correctly bumpus was not the only frightened scout about that time with the wounded grizzly charging the camp he had plenty of company when they had finished eating the fire was put out and after that they made for the spot where thad had found the trail of the lost scout it was plain as day just there even though some twenty-four hours have passed since the fat and ambitious Nemrod passed that way. Giraffe and Stefan were suspicious of the two rascally timber cruisers and persisted in keeping their eyes constantly on the alert, searching every possible spot for an ambush or holding their guns ready for quick work. The patrol leader did not attempt to interfere, although he and Alan were of the opinion 
that the men would not bother trying to look them up. It gave the boys more or less practice, and did no harm. And so the little bunch of scouts started to once more lift the trail of their missing chum. End of chapter 9 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan Chapter 10 of the Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter Chapter 10 The Bobcat the morning was half gone, and they had been making pretty good progress. But, said Giraffe, when Alan mentioned this fact, if we were only holding our own, that means we'll never glimpse the poor old chap in a week, lest he just drops down and from behind so worn out, reduced to skin and bone, so to speak. And both he and Stefan chuckled at the possibility of Bumpus ever coming to such an end. Oh, I don't know, said Alan. There's always a chance that you might sight him somewhere. You see, he turns every which way. Now he's headed almost north. And a little while back, it was nearly due east. Perhaps he may double back on his tracks yet. We can't tell. And if he did and happened to discover all our footprints, what do you think the blessed innocent would do? Asked Giraffe. He'd be scared stiff, most likely, and think Injuns must be trailing him, bound to take his scalp, laughed Stephen. Thad stopped for a minute's breathing spell. I think both of you are wrong there, he remarked, and, and if Bumpus only happened to come on his own trail after we'd passed along, the chances are he'd just make up his mind to sit down and wait for us to come around. Well, you don't say, exclaimed Stephen. How in the wide world would Bumpus ever guess it was us making those tracks? Giraffe demanded incredulously. He wouldn't have to guess, because he'd know. He must believe that fat chum of ours is waking up. Thad, just tell us, will you now how he'd be so dead sure of this? We haven't been dropping our visiting cards along the way that I saw, and Stephen gave Giraffe a sly wink. Well... We have right along, Tad continued, and unless I'm mistaken, Bumpus can read the signs all right. He knows what kind of an imprint your shoe makes, Stephen, and how there's a bunch of nails shaped like a star in both of your heels. Look down there, and you'll notice them. Well, I'll be jiggered. If that ain't it, muttered the surprised Stephen, as the fact was quite new to him. And Giraffe, he also knows that your toe in with your right foot so that each time you step, it makes a little peculiar scrape. Bend down, I'll show you. Here, and here, and here. Catch on to it now, Giraffe? Well, I never knew that before. But it's a fact. I do turn my foot some. I admit, tried to break off the habit lots of times, but it's no use. More than that, said Thad. Look at my track, and you'll see there's a marked peculiarity that makes it different from any other tracks. I had a piece put on each heel, and the line shows as plain as anything. And now here's Alan's footprint. Did you see anything about that you'd likely to recognize if you ran across it again? Sure we do, burst out Giraffe. The shoe is square at the toes, broader than any other. Besides that, Alan walks with feet nearly straight, and most people turn them out some, all but those that toe in. Well, you see now that each of you has his individual mark, continued the patrol leader, wishing to impress the lessons on the others. Yes, that's all right, Thad, but how would a tenderfoot like Bumpus know all about these things, persisted Giraffe. How do you know, demanded the leader. Um, because you told us, I guess, the tall scout admitted. Well, that's just the case with Bumpus, went on Thad. Of late, he's taken a remarkably deep interest in the thousand and one things that are open to the eyes of a scout if only he chooses to look around. And so when he asked about following a trail, I showed him how to tell the marks of every scout in the patrol, himself included, and Bobus wrote them all down in that little notebook he carries. 
Well, if that don't beat all creation, exclaimed Giraffe. Just imagine the poor boy squatting down to pull out his notebook and then say, there, I know Giraffe made those tracks, and the other must be made by the manly tread of my good friend Stephen Bingham. I guess it's up to us to improve each shining hour ourselves, Giraffe, like the busy little bee. We don't want a tenderfoot like Bumpus to beat us out, do we? Not much we don't, said Giraffe. And for three minutes the two of them were busily engaged writing descriptions in their scout's notebook, with which every one in the patrol was provided, stopping now and then to examine or measure one of the tracks. When this operation was concluded, much to the amazement of Thad and Allen, the forward movement was again resumed. But it seemed as though the little innocent must have aroused the curiosity and ambition of Giraffe and Stephen, for they frequently asked questions that had more or less bearing on trailing. And the information which Allen was able to give, in addition to what the scoutmaster said, quite enthused both searchers after facts. Hey, I never thought there was so much in this tracking business, Stephen honestly admitted. I used to believe it was pretty much of a fake. And that feller just went along, smelling out things just like a setter or a beagle or a hound would. But now I see it's a whole lot of fun, and I'm going to go for it. I'm into tracking, and I'm going to be a champion tracker. Look out there, fellers, shouted Giraffe. They saw him swing his gun around and almost immediately discharge the heavy rifle. All the others hastened to get their guns in a serviceable condition. Even while they were looking to see what had happened to excite the tall scout, something flashed from one tree to another, and vanished amidst the dense growth of leaves. As this tree was close to the others, the chances were that the animal would have little difficulty in eluding them. "'Wow, a big wildcat!' exclaimed Stephen, in great excitement. "'Tell me, did you see his left hind leg dragging just a little when he landed on that limb?' asked Giraffe eagerly. Oh, you aimed to take him out on the left hind leg, did you? jeered Stephen, advancing a pace in the hope of discovering the beast crouching above and offering a fair target. I hadn't time to aim, but just shot any old way, declared the other. Fact is, I don't believe the butt of my gun was more than halfway to my shoulder when I let it go. He was a going to jump right there, and I knew it was hit or miss with me. Dangerous thing to do when it's a Lennox or a Bobcat, remarked Allen, who, being a Maine boy, had had lots of experience with the fierce beast. Better have let him get clean away, but I don't think you wounded him, Giraffe. Huh, why not? said Giraffe. Because I never knew a wild cat that was wounded to run away, Allen replied. Once you give them pain, and you can make up your mind you've got a fight on your hands, and the chances are a warm one, too. Well, I tried for him anyway, he remarked. Let's see if we can get glimpses of his old staring yellow eyes somewhere up there. But they failed to do so. Make up your minds, he's got clean off before now, said Allen. The way one of these big cats can spring from tree to tree is fierce. But we haven't the time just now to be looking for cats. I don't believe we lost any, do you, Thad? But that old rascal seemed to be hanging on a limb just about over where our tenderfoot party must have passed by, ventured Giraffe, a new fear arising in his breast. Oh, I hope now he wasn't there when Bumpus came along, remarked Stephen, as if comprehending the thought that had taken form in the mind of his comrades. What does this mean, Thad? asked Allen, just then pointing down close to his feet, and the other three uttering various exclamations when they saw what he was referring to. Spots of dried blood, gasped giraffe it is now for a fact stephen followed with oh that cat must have jumped on poor old bumpus and clawed him up something scandalous he bled like a stuck pig as he ran off and see here where something has been dragging along the ground what if it's wounded bad he had to pull one leg after another this is just awful fellas poor old bumpus but Thad and Allen somehow did not seem to join with the others in feeling sorry. At least they made no remarks. And as they all walked slowly on, following the blood-stained tracks, if 
Draft or Stefan, instead of keeping their eyes slowly close to the ground, had ventured to raise them a little, so as to take in the faces of their chums, doubtless their surprise would have been great to notice that Thad wore a broad smile, while Allen was making various suggestive gestures and winking one eye in the direction of the scoutmaster. So they walked slowly forward, a score or more of paces, when Giraffe and Stefan were once more startled. This time it was not by the sudden appearance of a ferocious wild beast, but only the voice of Allen calling out, Oh, look, look, what can that be hanging yonder from the limb of that tree? End of chapter 10 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan Chapter 11 of the Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber This is our LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter Chapter 11 Bumpus Stock Above Par same old cat again burst out giraffe and he was in the act of raising his gun to his shoulder this time when thad caught hold of it don't be silly giraffe cried the patrol leader but it is a cat exclaimed the other rubbing his eyes with the knuckles of one hand and looking again meanwhile stephen had cautiously advanced a pace or two staring at the dangling object as though he did not know whether to really believe his eyes or not giraffe seeing him go on pushed to his side and when the two of them came close to the object that had gripped their attention they turned to exchange a dead cat said giraffe solemnly and hung up by the hind legs to that limb now who could have done that demanded stephen must have been the same old critter that tackled our poor chum bumpus back yonder some friendly forest ranger just happened along in the nick of time and used his rifle on the yowler. Here's where the bullet hit him, right in the heart, and Giraffe laid his finger on the wound. But say, here's where another caught him on the square of the head, and this hole shows where yet a third passed through his body. Why, well, he's been riddled, all shot to pieces. That's plain, Stephen declared positively, and the other two listened, not wanting to break in just yet. Buckshot, not a rifle bullet, ended the cat here. That's for sure, said Giraffe. And say, Bumpus is carrying a two-shot Marlin scattergun that uses buckshot cartridges, went on Stephen. They looked at each other again, and then once more eyed the swinging trophy of someone's kill. But it's silly to think of him knocking over a ferocious animal like this here cat, Giraffe ventured to say. And there saw a bigger one he must have looked fierce enough i tell you when he was alive and could arch up his back and just growl in a way to make your blood run cold um supposing you take a squint up there where the legs are tied to the limb of the tree giraffe suggested stephen chuckling now with a new sense of humor the tall scout craned his long neck the better to see jupiter says that does look like it now he admitted that's what it is sure enough allowed stephen a piece cut from that rope bumpus carries you could see its braided sash cord and to know that old rope among a thousand he's done it all right bumpus did giraffe whistled to indicate the extent of his amazement who'd ever think he had it in him he observed scratching his head as he stood there and gazing at the dangling wildcat I reckon now he must have had the best luck ever when he just shut his eyes and pulled the trigger. This old cat must have wanted to commit suicide. Perhaps he just climbed up and looked into the muzzle of Bumpus's gun. You know better than that, Giraffe. He must have been some distance away or else the buckshot wouldn't have scattered as much as it did. I reckon. Now our fat chum is improving a heap. That was a great shot. Good for you, Stephen, Thad broke in to say. And take another look at the cat, will you? Tell me if you see anything strange about him. I imagine the one giraffe chased away was a mate to this. I must have been smelling at the body still when we came up. Stephen uttered a little cry and then remarked, 
Well, would you believe it? The old thing was a cripple. You can see he had only three paws. The half four paw is gone. Like it or not, it was bitten off in some fight he had long ago. Ah, oh, you're wrong, cried Giraffe. I leaned forward to examine the injury at closer quarters. There ain't any old hurt. The blood is as fresh as the rest. And I guess it only happened yesterday. Fine, go on, declared Thad, and the tall scout spurred him on by that word of commendation. To exert himself to the utmost was quick to continue. I could see the paw wasn't bitten off, nor yet shot away, he remarked. The cut is as clean as a whistle, and I reckon only a sharp hunting knife would do the job like that. But what would Bumpus do to go and hack a paw off the old cat for? objected Stephen. Why, a trophy, silly, answered the other quickly. He just don't know how to skin the beast and hardly like the job of toting it all around with him. So you see, to convince the rest of us that he had really and truly knocked over Wildcat, he just took that paw along. How's that, Mr. Scoutmaster? You hit the nail on the head that time, Giraffe, answered Thad, pleased at the way the other had figured things out, for it proved that once aroused to do his best, the tall scout possessed the ability requiring for reading signs. And this was one of those things that Thad Brewster, as acting head of the troop, always tried to impress upon the minds of the scouts under him. Let every tub stand on its own bottom. Learn to depend on yourself. Do your own thinking. Keep on the watch. And see all the wonderful things that are constantly happening around you in the great storehouse of nature. Be awake, active in a word. As the manual of the organization has it, be prepared. Giraffe and Stephen had been tremendously staggered by the knowledge that the stout comrade, whom they always looked down as a weakling and called their tenderfoot pard, with such a tone of patronage, seemed to be actually waking up and doing things. It was not enough that he exhibit the nerve to go out in the search of a bear all by himself. There was that episode of the muck bed, for example, that sent Bumpus' stock up a few points above par. It revealed the fact that, in an emergency, the fat boy could actually think for himself. Instead of allowing himself to get rattled after discovering that he was gripped fast in the tenacious mud, Bumpus had looked around and noticed that a convenient limb was above his head. Of course he had stretched out his hands toward it, but vainly as they must have fallen short by two feet or more of reaching the limb. And then Bumpus remembered the fine rope he was carrying around his fat waist, under the conviction that it might come in handy some other time. Well, it did. Bumpus had drawn himself out of the mud and up to the friendly limb of the tree, though it surely must have been proven most severe tax on his untrained muscles. He was such a heavy weight. Draft admitted deep down in his mind that he could not have done any better himself. And now here was the same blundering, awkward Bumpus actually knocking over a monstrous wildcat, one of the most ferocious animals roaming through the swamps adjoining the big timber belt. It was commencing to dawn upon the minds of those two boys that beginning right now, they would have to revise their opinion of Bumpus. He hardly seemed to fit a candidate for the greenhorn grade of scout. Really, there seemed to be some class to his work. He was putting up that promise to raise him high in the estimation of his comrades. In fact, both of the boys who stood there examining the hanging bobcat were beginning to wonder what next Bumpus would do. Seems to be another feller, remarked Stephen. Right you are, Rob. I never would have believed he had it in him. Biggest surprise ever. Gosh, Stephen, it wouldn't take much to make me expect bigger things. You mean that if he keeps on going at this warm pace, Bumpus might even get his old bear yet. Who knows? Giraffe asserted. Thad and Allen noticed with considerable amusement and satisfaction that the boys no longer alluded to the lost comrade as poor old Bumpus or our tenderfoot pard. Their pity for the clumsy scout was fast changing into sincere admiration, respect, and surely Bumpus deserved it. A good lesson all around, eh, Thad? whispered Allen in the other's ear. Just what it is, 
was the scoutmaster's reply in the same low tone. Bumpus is learning to depend on himself, Allan went on, and these boys have been taught to be more careful how they allow themselves to feel so superior to a comrade who happens to be slower about waking up. They won't forget this in a hurry. Sure they won't, added Allan. Come, boys, let's be going, Thad remarked aloud. I don't exactly like the looks of the sky over yonder where the breeze is coming out of. These words of the scoutmaster caused Giraffe and Stephen to turn and look back on them. So much engaged had they been in keeping tabs on the trail and scanning the woods on either side for a possible glimpse of Bumpus that neither of them had once bothered about looking at the heavens. Hence a great surprise awaited them. Wow! Did you ever see such blacker clouds? exclaimed Giraffe, apparently deeply impressed by what he had discovered. Looks like we might be in for a big storm, remarked Stephen, uneasily, for he never felt as brave as he might when the elements were battling with one another. But in order to disguise his timidity, he added, But then, as we ain't sugar or salt, I guess we won't melt. As they hurried along through the timber, still following the plain trail left by the lost scout, it might have been noticed that Allan and Thad really looked more serious than the other pair, and there was good reason for it, too. End of chapter 11 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan Chapter 12 of The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter 12 The Swoop of the Storm. Oh, she's coming right along, all right. Stephen volunteered the statement when the when the first rumble of thunder was borne to their ears from the direction whence the storm was advancing. Hear that? added Giraffe. I say, Thad, don't you think we'd better let up on this trail business and hunt for a place where we might sit it out the storm? I just come to that conclusion myself, replied the other, and it seems to me we hadn't ought to lose any too much valuable time in going that, remarked Stephen starting a little when there came a flash of lightning and a later on another deep growl of thunder still three miles away i count between the flash and the thunder announced giraffe huh three miles ain't a song when the old wind gets a blowin declared stephen notice that it's died out altogether now fellers and getting pretty dark too giraffe added looks to me like we might be in for a little cyclone. Wonder if they ever have them up here, like they do in Kansas. Cyclone, exclaimed Stephen. Oh, my stars, and here we are without even a cyclone cellar. We'll try and find one, said Thad, encouragingly, for he had been keeping his eye around him a long time back, noting the formation of the ground and the drawing of his own conclusions. They were no longer walking steadily on. Thad had increased his pace to a run, and his comrades kept it aside as though determined not to be left in the lurch. The sounds from the rear had gradually increased in volume. The thunder was louder and more ominous, and each dazzling flash of lightning made the timber around them stand out more distinctly, although after it had passed, the semi-gloom seemed more appalling than ever. And that other threatening sound, could it be the wind playing havoc with the trees? Thad had from time to time noticed that they came up a window of fallen timber, all the trees lying in one direction. This circumstance had told them that once in a great while the region of the foot of the Rockies was visited by a destructive storm. Might not this one prove to be such and throw down more of these giants of the woods? Thad had to bear this in mind, and along with many other things, surely. If the storm proved to be so severe that the trees were going to be uprooted and blown down, they wanted to be out of danger. Stephen was getting more and more excited. He always felt this way, even at home, when the air was charged with electricity. 
Many a time he could remember walking up and down a room like a tiger in a cage, while the elements were holding high carnival without, and while he believed that the scoutmaster would do all that lay in his power to get himself and his comrades into some sort of shelter before the threatening storm broke over their heads, Stephen saw no reason why he should not assist as far as he could. So he kept those sharp eyes of his on the constant watch as he ran along the side of the pacemaker. Suddenly, Stephen gave a triumphant shout. Oh, oh, look, look, here's a good place for us to crawl in, and he pointed to one side as he spoke. There, as another bright flash lighted up the gloomy forest, Thad saw an enormous tree, easily the king of them all. Doubtless it outtopped all his comrades, rearing its lofty head far above the best of them. And yet old age had started in to demolish the monarch of the woods, beginning at the butt instead of the top. The giant tree was hollow. There yawned an aperture, surely large enough to hold the four scouts easily, if they chose to huddle there and the hole is pretty well away from the track of the storm. So the rain ain't going to beat in on us, Stephen went on. Do we crawl in, Thad? asked Giraffe, showing by his manner that he was only too willing to comply if the scoutmaster said the word. But Thad and Allen exchanged a look, and each shook his head. No tree for mine in a storm like this. Come on, boys, called out the leader. Once more, starting on a run. Stephen hesitated. It even seemed as though the spirit of finding safety was tempting him to hold back. If he thought Giraffe would back him up, Stephen might possibly have declined to leave the big hollow tree that looked so inviting. But Giraffe, either more submissive to authority just then, or else not quite so frightened by the crash of the approaching storm, was already hurrying after the leader. So Stephen went on although grumbling why couldn't we use that nice old hiding place that he called out for the thunder together with the roar of the wind and the rain in their rear made so much racket that talking in ordinary tones was impossible that tree might go down with a crash and a gale was what tad said over his shoulder as he ran well perhaps that's so admitted stephen and worse than that it was liable to be struck by lightning added the young scoutmaster nearly always picks out the tallest tree or one standing alone you never want to get under a tree in a thunderstorm remember that stephen better lie down flat on the ground and take your soaking even though the advice was shouted at him under such peculiar conditions stephen was apt to remember it indeed those very conditions served to impress it indelibly on his mind he would never again hear the crash of thunder and see the vivid flash of lightning without remembering what Thad had said. What does a little wedding amount to besides the peril of sudden death? Every day during the summer there can be found brief accounts of men or boys killed by lightning because they took refuge under a tree when a storm interrupted their work in the harvest field. During an ordinary shower, a tree might be an acceptable shelter, but never when the air is supercharged with electricity since it serves as a conductor to draw lightning. But what are we going to do? It was Giraffe who broke out with this appeal. Shortly after, they left the neighborhood of the hollow tree that had so tempted Stephen. Up to this point, the tall scout had been blindly following Thad's lead. The quality of obedience was plainly well developed in Giraffe, but now his curiosity seemed to get the better of these other traits in his character. Although he did not come from Missouri, and in fact, still Giraffe wanted to know, nor did Thad seem to take it amiss in a comrade asking such a natural question under the circumstances. He was always willing to volunteer information. Get an idea we ought to find some ledges on the other side of this little rocky knob hill on the left, he called out. Oh, said Stephen. That was exact of his remarks, and for several reasons in the first place, he had considerable confidence in Thad's judgment, for he had seen it successfully tried under many conditions, and what the other suggested appealed to Stephen as reasonable. Then again, he was short of breath and needed all he possessed in order to keep running along with the others. Stephen and Giraffe kept pretty well up in the van. Now and then, when a particularly fearful flash came, 
they would turn part way around as though the fascination of that oncoming tempest was too much for them and sometimes either one would give utterance to an excited whoop when the timber was lighted up by an unusually dazzling flash though the cry was seemed to be immediately deadened by the reverberating thunder they also noticed with some degree of satisfaction that they were even then rounding the low rocky elevation unless thad had made a sad mistake in his judgment they should know the facts before another minute passed but so rapidly was the storm coming along now that apparently they would have none too generous an allowance of time with the rush of the wind another sound beginning to be heard that was quite disconcerting this was a frequent crash such as even giraffe and stephen knew must accompany the fall of trees they were glad on this account if for no other that thad had led them by degrees out of the big timber so they now skirted the base of the singular little rocky formation that was almost devoid of trees the thought of being in constant danger of having one of those giants topple over on their heads was far from pleasant between the flashes that had become oppressively dark so much so that the boys had to be more careful when they set their feet but with all that turmoil of shrieking winds crashing of falling trees and roar of thunder chasing along in the rear and rapidly overtaking him it was little wonder that at times they made mistakes in where they stepped and presently what that had been fearing came to pass when stephen shouted out at the top of his voice hold up thad Graf's taken a tumble and i reckon he's some hurt end of chapter twelve recording by kenneth sergeant gagan chapter thirteen of the boy scouts through the big timber this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anthony jackson the boy scouts through the big timber by herbert carter chapter thirteen the bolt of lightning in the midst of such a confusion of dreadful sounds and knowing that in another minute or so they would be overtaken by the storm it was little wonder that thad's heart seemed to feel a cold clutch when step hen burst out with that announcement what if giraffe had broken a leg in taking this tumble he was that tall and possessed such spindle legs as the boys always called them that they often joked him on the probability of his cracking a bone when he slid to second base and it was in dreadful fear then that the scoutmaster halted to turn hastily around to his satisfaction he saw that giraffe helped by step hen was already scrambling to his feet although limping some all right giraffe called out thad on deck go ahead came the cheery reply and shutting his teeth hard together giraffe managed to once more start on a run after his chief though his bruised leg must have hurt him considerably they were now turning the side of the rocky elevation and just as thad had said it seemed to be made up of little ledges one above the other this was not a mere guess on thad's part for he had noticed the same peculiar formation in connection with several other outcroppings they had passed these being offshoots of the foothills at the base of the rocky mountains and so again did that policy of observation noticing things promise to prove of great assistance to the fugitive scouts when chased by the storm it often does and the boy who keeps his eye about him under any and all circumstances is the one who reaps the profit there is never an emergency arises but he is ready with some remedy to meet it when they saw these friendly ledges the other boys realized that for the time being their troubles were about at an end there would be plenty of chances for them to find shelter here thad did not accept of the very first refuge that offered because he knew 
there was still a little more time at their disposal, and he had had an idea they would presently come upon a ledge capable of covering them all. It turned out just as he figured. When the four crept under the outcropping shelf of a rock, they found that they had no longer any need to fear the violence of the gale. The lightning could not well reach them here. The wind was powerless to do them any harm. There were no threatening trees to topple over upon their heads, and as for the rain, it would sweep past and leave them perfectly dry. No wonder, then, that Step Hen, in the sudden change of his feelings from dark despair to complete satisfaction, gave vent to a scout whoop, while Giraffe, equally pleased, uttered several fox barks, that being the distinguishing signal of the patrol by which members would recognize each other if approaching in the dark. This is something like, cried Step Hen, in between the thunderclaps. As comfy as if we were at home, added Giraffe, who was sitting there gingerly rubbing his bruised shin. A tremendous crash made further talk just then out of the question, and it seemed as though that thunderclap might have been the signal that the stage was all set, and the war of the elements could begin. The wind started in with a furious rush that snapped off several trees not far from where the four scouts huddled under their shelter. These came crashing down, as, th as though loudly protesting against their untimely fate. But the sound of their fall was really swallowed up in all the other mad noises that marked the first rush of the summer storm. How the wind did whistle through the tops of the trees that bent before its fury, together with the downpour of rain. The ones that could prove most humble and bow their proud heads best were those that came out of the turmoil with the least damage. The trees could adapt themselves to circumstances, the scouts saw, and surely there was another lesson for them all in that. After a furious rush, the storm slackened up a little, as though gathering force for a fresh outburst, perhaps more strenuous than before. But this little breathing spell afforded the boys a chance to exchange a few remarks since it is at all times a difficult task to keep their tongues from wagging. That was a swift one, all right, Giraffe burst out with. Did you ever hear such thunder, said Alan. And the lightning, oh my stars, it just made me blink and shiver every time it flash, declared Step Hen. Well, the worst is yet to come, announced Thad seriously. He's joking, cried out Step Hen. No, I'm not, the scoutmaster went on. I've always noticed that when a storm lets up like this, it generally hits harder the next spell. And you'll find out if you wait a minute, for it's coming again. But we're all right here, ain't we? asked Giraffe. Sure, replied the other, unless it turns around. Turns around? ejaculated Step Hen. Do you mean to say old wind could take a kink in itself and come back on us? It often happens during a storm. In the beginning it may beat down on you from the east and finish up in the southwest. But I guess the second half of this one is coming out of the same quarter as the first. Good for that, exclaimed Step Hen. We're all so cozy under here. I'd hate to have the wind drive that wet rain in on us. There she comes, boys. Woo! Say, listen to that, would ya? I hope that thunder don't start the rocks to rolling down this slope. No danger of that, called out Thad, for with the return of the furious bombardment, talking was becoming more difficult. Just as the scout leader had said it, it really did look as though this second half of the storm promised to be more violent than the one that had gone booming along its way. It seemed to the boys that some of the thunderclaps would split their eardrums, so powerful did they appear. The rain again fell in torrents, too. They could hear it rushing furiously down the side of the little rocky hill. Several spouts shot over the outcropping ledge that served as their roof. But despite it all, none of them so much as had a sprinkle fall upon them. 
Never had the wisdom and sagacity of the scoutmaster been more amply proven than right then, and doubtless each of the other three boys must have been secretly saying as much, as they crouched there gazing in speechless wonder and awe at the curious freaks shown by the zigzagged forked lightning every time it came down from the black vault above or played tag among the piled up masses of clouds that were slowly retreating. Apparently the worst was over. Even then, doubtless, there was a break in the van of the storm clouds. Furious though the tempest had been, it was to prove of short duration. But while it lasted, Thad reckoned that it was about as tropical in its nature as any he had ever encountered. Glad it's going, called out Giraffe. It never will be missed, sang Step Hen, feeling particularly joyous over the fact that after all they had come through it all unscathed. The rain stopped, that's sure, Giraffe asserted. And that means the danger's over. We can go out now, when we please, Step Hen remarked, making a movement as if to rise. Hold on, I wouldn't do that yet, exclaimed Thad. Why not? asked Step Hen, but at the same time falling back. There's a lot of dangerous electricity in the air still, said Thad. You can see that the reports after each flash are as quick and powerful as if a 12-inch gun on a battleship were being fired. Every bolt strikes just after a storm has passed. Lots of people say the back action is the most dangerous time of all. Oh, all right, Thad. Guess I'll stay here a while longer. No need of a feller taking more chances than he has to. And Step Hen settled down again. For if there was any danger of being struck by lightning, no one would find him careless. But this is the end, ain't it, Thad? Asked Giraffe, still rubbing at his leg. I reckon it is, replied the patrol leader. Wonder how our fellers in camp stood the racket. Hope the tents didn't get blown away, Step Hen remarked. And Bumpus, I reckon he'll be put to his wit's end to know what to do at such a time as this. But Thad noticed that when he said it, Giraffe really betrayed an undercurrent of respect in his manner. Bumpus was no longer a complete ignoramus. Bumpus had raised himself wonderfully in the estimation of his chums. Just then there was an unusually brilliant flash. The thunder seemed to really accompany it, showing that the bolt struck near at hand. Wow, that hit something as sure as you live, exclaimed Giraffe. Thought I heard branches crashing down, and I reckon it must have been a tree, remarked Step Hen, who had given a nervous jump at the brilliant and dazzling illumination. It did shatter a tree and over in the very place we came from, too. To tell you the truth, fellas, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if it wasn't that same big tree that had so splendid a hollow in its butt. Step Hen turned very white when he heard Thad say this, and a painful silence fell upon the little group of scouts under the friendly ledge. End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of the Boy Scouts through the Big Timber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Jackson. The Boy Scouts through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter fourteen. Step Hen looks out for the provisions. Some little time passed. Gradually the storm was passing away in the distance where they could still hear the constant growl and mutter of the thunder. But those nearby crashes had really ceased. As the boys were cramped and becoming restless, Thad saw no reason why they should not get out in the open again. First I want to look at that leg of yours, Giraffe, said the scoutmaster. Aw, oh, I guess I'll manage all right, replied the other his pride revolting at such a thing as showing the white feather. All the same, it ought to be looked after, persisted Thad. 
We can't afford to take any chances of your being lamed. A stiff leg is a constant bother, and there's no need of it when I've got liniment and salve and linen in my haversack for just such uses. Here, roll up the leg of your trousers and let Doc Thad take a look. No nonsense now, Giraffe. It's orders. So protesting still that it didn't amount to a row of pins, Giraffe nevertheless obeyed the injunction of the patrol leader. There, it is quite an ugly wound, and bleeding too, declared Thad. And you might have had a heap of trouble with that same hurt, Giraffe, if you didn't let me put some salve on it. It's an open cut, and the liniment would bite too much. Besides, this healing salve is better. And so, Thad soon had a nice bandage fastened snugly about the hurt. Giraffe frankly admitted that it did feel soothed by the application, though he still had to limp more or less when he walked naturally favoring the lame leg. Now we can go ahead again and find old Bumpus, Step Hen remarked, after the operation had been successfully finished. That's the worst of it all, said Alan, with a disconsolate shrug of his shoulders and making a wry face at the same time. Worst of what? demanded Step Hen. Ain't we going to pick up the trail at the place we lost it, or back where the old cat hangs? There isn't any trail, Alan replied. What? ejaculated both Step Hen and Giraffe, amazed by his declaration that filled them with dismay. The rain washed it all out, you see, Alan went on to explain. But how are we a going to find Bumpus then? Step Hen gasped. Again, the main boy shrugged his shoulders, and there was something very expressive about the movement. Ask me something easy, please. I confess I'm all up in the air. I don't know how we can find our chum, unless by an accident later on we come upon his fresh trail again made after the storm. And that's supposing a good many things, you see, one of which is that he's come out of the racket safe and sound. Whew. Strikes me we've got as much of a chance of running across him as we have finding a needle in a haystack, ventured Giraffe. Just about as much, Alan replied, looking downcast. As long as there was any trail to find, Alan was not the one to give up. He would hang on tenaciously while a shred of hope remained. But with the tracks of Bumpus positively washed out by the downpour from the clouds, it was useless wasting time in looking for any signs. Even Thad seemed serious now. Troubles were accumulating thick and fast. For the missing member of the Silver Fox Patrol. Though thus far Bumpus seemed to have surmounted his trials and difficulties, he might have been caught unawares by that furious storm. And what if he had been tempted to seek shelter in a hollow tree, not having a wise scoutmaster handy to warn against the evil of such a thing? Giraffe and Step Hen felt very uneasy at even the thought. They left the vicinity of the ledges and once more entered the tall timber. But the others knew that Thad was indulging in no hope that they could ever discover any signs of the trail, or follow it, even though an occasional footprint remained. He had some other purpose in leading them backward, and they could hazard a pretty good guess as to what it might be. There were abundant signs of the storm's passage all around them. Some of the more slender trees still bowed their heads in the direction where far away in the distance the thunder still growled and muttered. Here and there the boys could see one that had been up uprooted, and either thrown flat to the ground, or else received in the sheltering embrace of some neighbor that held it in a half-reclining attitude. And presently Giraffe gave vent to a loud cry. It did strike Step Hen's tree, he exclaimed. Where is it? I don't see the same, demanded Step Hen. Look again, rub your eyes, and wake up. Don't you glimpse that pile of branches over there, scattered in every direction? asked Giraffe. Sure I do, admitted the other. But how do you know now that wreckage came from my tree? Why, that's easy, replied Giraffe. Notice that shattered trunk partly standing yet? Well, step this way, and you can see where part, only part, mind you, step in, is left of that hiding place you wanted to crawl in. Oh, my stars, ejaculated the other scout, when his staring eyes told him that what his comrade said was the awful truth. 
It had been the luckiest escape those four boys would ever know. They felt a great awe steal over them, accompanied by a sensation of thanksgiving, as they stood there looking at the ruin of that once proud king of the woods. None of us would ever know what hit us, I guess, said Step Hen finally. And I reckon I've learned my lesson all right, added the tall scout. Just as Thad said, what's a ducking when you think of taking chances with a thing like this? I am for wetting down every time after this. But what had we better do? Head back for camp and give our poor old chum Bumpus up for good? Asked Step Hen dejectedly. Not just yet, the scoutmaster replied. We've got some grub still, suggested Giraffe, and can make fires all right, no matter how wet the wood got. Yes, we can stay out for another day or two, said Thad, and longer than that if we think there's any chance of finding him, because we can knock over some game at the worst. But what's the program, persisted Giraffe? Are we going to lay out some sort of plan and then follow it up, or just go meandering around every which way, trusting to sheer luck? We'll try and figure on what Bumpus was most likely to do, said Thad, and then pattern our plan after that. And later on, you know, we could give a shout once in a while. If he was near enough to us, he might hear us that way. You're right, Thad, and it's a good scheme, declared Giraffe. A dandy one, added Step Hen. And if ever Bumpus hears me a shoutin', he'll know who it is, all right. I should say yes, Giraffe observed with such a meaning look that the other took umbrage at once and flamed out with, "'Tain't any more like the caw of a crow than your squawk is, giraffe, and you know it, even if you used to say so. That's because you was envious, because outside of Bumpus himself, I could sing better than any other scout in the whole troop." Giraffe made no answer to this taunt. He only looked appealing toward Thad, as much as to say that he was not to blame for this flare-up. They walked on for a while, although the going was not so very pleasant, owing to the fact that the bushes were all so wet, they had to avoid contact with him. Allen and Thad conferred as they went, and apparently must have laid out their plans, for the others presently became aware of the fact that they seemed to be moving ahead in something like a direct line. Although they had thus far met with no great success, Step Hen and Giraffe still felt considerable confidence in their leaders. Thad and Allen seemed so able to cope with anything and everything that came along, it was no wonder the others had begun to believe they could accomplish the impossible. But when the afternoon waned and another night stared them in the face, they had to temporarily forget about Bumpus and consider their own condition. A fire would certainly be needed, for everything around them was still wet, and as the droppings from the trees had partly soaked their garments, they thought they must dry out. But a piece of luck came their way about this time that was as welcome as it was unexpected. Step Hen happened to be out on the left flank, and suddenly the others heard the report of his rifle in that quarter. As they hastily turned around, it was to see Step Hen dancing madly up and down. I got it, I got it, he was shouting clawing at his little repeating rifle in the endeavor to work the pump action and render it serviceable again. Got what? demanded Giraffe, running up. A deer, replied the other. Yes, you have. Tell us where, asked the tall scout incredulously. Over back of them bushes. It was just going to jump when I let go. Guess it dropped in its tracks, panted Step Hen. Giraffe gave a mocking laugh. We'll see if you put a flim-flam bullet into an old stump, he remarked derisively, limping forward, and immediately shouting, Well, of all the world, if he didn't get the nicest little buck you ever saw, and shot straight through the heart. No wonder he went down kerflop. Step Hen, you're going some. I'll have to look out or else you'll be crowding at my heels. Beat that snapshot if you can, giraffe, said the other, proudly looking down at his quarry. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of the Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Jackson. 
The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter Chapter 15 Through the Big Timber Again That night the boys feasted. After being without fresh meat for some little time now, that venison certainly did taste prime, and no doubt it was doubly sweet to Step Hen, who had made the best shot of his life when he brought the game down. At least they need no longer think of being compelled to return to the camp near the foot of the noisy rapids on account of a lack of food. They could go a number of days subsisting on the new supply that had stocked up their almost exhausted larder so handsomely. But there was a weight resting on all of them. They talked some, but most of the time after supper they sat there looking into the comfortable blaze and busy with their thoughts. What these were, as a rule, might be gathered from a remark made by Step Hen. It was a good supper, all right, and that deer meat went just prime. Only wish he's got as good tonight. And no one asked him who he meant. No doubt every one of the four around the fire had Bumpus in mind right then and there. And we're going to keep this fire burning through the live long night, too, said Thad later on when there was some talk of going to sleep. Regardless of Hank and Pierre, huh? asked Giraffe, his eyes brightening, for he never liked to see a campfire go out. It was always as solemn a ceremony in his mind as the passing of a dear friend would be. Oh, like as not they're miles and miles away from here, Thad went on to say. And anyhow, one of us at a time will be on guard all night. If he hears a shot or a distant shout, be sure to call me up, whoever he may be. And that, then, was the program laid down. They would do everything in their power to attract the attention of the wandering Bumpus, in case he happened to be anywhere in the neighborhood. But it was of no avail. Doubtless, one or the other of the scouts, when standing his turn as sentry, may have fancied he heard faraway hails, because the wish was father to the thought but upon listening to make doubly sure before arousing the others, it had invariably turned out that the sound was an owl calling to his mate in the depth of the big timber, or the strange cry of the nighthawk abroad seeking food. But all the live long night that watch fire continued to burn, although without any result. The boys went about their duties in the morning, a little crestfallen, and yet they had no reason to reproach themselves, having done everything in their power to win success. As they ate breakfast, they tried to lay out the day's campaign. Enough of the fresh venison was to be carried along to provide several meals, and as they went, they meant to let out a few shouts at intervals. Of course they knew that just one of them, Giraffe, had said before it was about as satisfactory as searching for a needle in a haystack but it was the best they could do, and boys as a rule are very prone to put considerable confidence in what they call luck. After the violent storm there was one good result at least, the air was as sweet and pure and invigorating as any of them could wish. Indeed Thad, as he glanced around and above him when they stopped once that morning to rest, thought he had never seen a lovelier picture and only for this weight resting so heavily upon his soul in connection with the fate of the missing tenderfoot he could have enjoyed it immensely the sky was the bluest of the blue with here and there a fleecy white cloud floating across it away up could be seen a pair of eagles sailing in immense circles and able to look directly into the face of the sun lower down a number of other large birds were floating around and it looked as though they might be centering over a certain spot. Thad recognized them as buzzards, those scavengers of the wilds that are protected by law in most sections of the country because of their usefulness in disposing of carrion that might otherwise breed an epidemic of disease. On one side, glimpses could be occasionally be had of the lofty mountains, to explore which had been one of the excuses the scouts had for making such a long journey. Apparently, the other boys were also looking around them, for presently, Step Hen, pointing with his finger, said, What are those birds away up there, Thad? 
The ones in the clouds, you mean, I suppose? asked the other. Yes, replied Step Hen. That is the majestic eagle, my son, said Giraffe pompously. Majestic humbug, laughed Allen. But they represent the American nation, objected Giraffe. Every time the papers get talking about trouble with foreign nations, they say, Now listen to the eagle scream, don't they? Oh, it can scream all right, and fight right hard, I admit, when it has to, Allen went on to say. But all this talk about the eagle being such a noble bird makes me weary. If you'd watched him as often as I have, sitting lazily on the limb of a dead tree, and waiting till some poor industrious fish hawk makes a haul so he could rob him, you wouldn't have quite so much respect for the magnificent bird as you do now. Huh, perhaps not, grunted Giraffe, looking crestfallen. Honest to goodness now, I always did think the old feller couldn't live up to his reputation. Guess America had ought to hunt up another emblem besides the eagle. But say, the mothers ain't eagles, I know, spoke up Step Hen. No, they are the despised buzzard that everybody shuns, yet no one kills, for he'd be far worse to eat than crow, said Thad. And yet, a ten times more useful bird than the eagle, which lives upon its ill-gotten reputation, and as I said before, the labor of the osprey or fishhawk, Allen went on to remark. But see him circle around, would you, Thad? Step Hen kept on. They generally do that, don't they, when they've discovered something worthwhile? Step Hen did not wholly voice the terrible fear that had suddenly gripped his heart in a sickening clutch. There was no need, for every one of the other scouts had a spasm along the same lines. They looked at each other rather guiltily. An undefined fear was written large upon each paling countenance. Thad, however, was the first to recover. You gave me an uneasy minute with the suggestion your words conjured up, Step Hen, he said firmly. But I just can't force myself to believe there's anything to it. But Thad, just hold on, Step Hen, the patrol leader went on to remark. I understand what you mean, and of course we'll head that way, to make sure it's a deer or something like that. None of them cared to pursue the matter any further. As they walked along, keeping one eye aloft to note the position of the buzzards that sailed around and around, constantly drooping lower, and with the other taking stock of their surroundings. Thad smiled after a while, but he did not take the trouble to communicate what was in his mind to the others. They'll know soon enough, he was saying to himself. Let them find it out for themselves. Allen was the first to make a discovery. He threw a quick, knowing look in the direction of the scoutmaster, who answered with a nod and a smile. Pretty soon, Giraffe began to smell a rat. Well, I declare, he remarked, seems like I've set eyes before on that there queer old tree with the big hump on its trunk. Can't be possible there could be another just like that anywhere this side of the Rockies. No one saying anything, Giraffe went on to remark. Yes, sir, it's the same identical tree. I'd take my affidavy on that. See, here's where I sliced off a bit of that bark with my hatchet as we went along. Now ain't that funny, we've made a grand circle ourselves, just like we thought he'd do, and crossed our own trail right here. Have you any idea where this tree is, Giraffe? asked Thad, meaning to test the memory of the observing scout. Let's see, when was it I noticed the same? and Giraffe frowned with the effort to whip his memory. Oh, yes, sure. I recollect it all now. Why, you see, Thad, it was just after we'd left that place where Bumpus had hung up that dead cat. Wow, there it hangs right there. And yes, as sure as you live, the wind brings us a whiff of it, too, cried Step Hen. Say, Thad, was this what the buzzard scented far off, and gathered here to make their dinner off? Just what it was, and they're welcome for all of me, replied the patrol leader, evidently greater relieved over something. But come on, boys, we're going to start on a new track from here, one we haven't been over yet, and I'm in hopes we may have the great good luck to learn something about our chum before we make another grand circuit. My first guess didn't pan out very well. None of them were sorry to leave the neighborhood of the dead cat 
which Bumpus had hung up in the tree, possibly in the hope of some time claiming its well-riddled pelt. An hour later they were making their way through a particularly bad stretch of woodland, where the brush was dense in places, and many trees, fallen years upon years ago, forced the scouts to either clamber over or go, or go around. Step Hen was just in the act of jumping over the half-rotten trunk of one of these fallen forest monarchs, when the rest heard him give utterance to a loud whoop, immediately followed by words that struck a chill to their very hearts. Dad, Alan, come here quick. I'm snake bit, and I reckon it was a big rattler that grabbed me by the leg. End of chapter 15「Sixteen of the Boy Scouts through the Big Timber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Jackson. The Boy Scouts through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter Sixteen: The Snake Bite. What can we do, Thad? exclaimed Giraffe as with the others he hurried over in the direction of Step Hen's voice. Step Hen had not kept exactly with his mates. Had he done so, the trouble that was now upon him might not have happened. Encouraged by his success of the preceding day, when he had secured a fine deer just because he hung upon the flank of the advancing party, Step Hen had wandered far afield again, though careful after a fashion never to lose sight of the rest. It was easy to understand, under the circumstances, how the ambitious Nimrod kept his eyes about him, looking for a possible deer to jump up and bound away. He had not been thinking of snakes at all, when so recklessly jumping over the dead tree, and this is always a more or less dangerous thing to do in a country where poisonous snakes may be found. They came upon the frightened step hen. He was down on one knee, and with hands that trembled so he could hardly work, was trying to roll up one of his trousers legs, after having kicked off his canvas legging. Thad was instantly at his side. Let me do that for you, Step Hen, he exclaimed, as he dropped his gun and applied himself to the task, to cry out a few seconds later, I don't see any marks where his fangs went in. Where was it he struck you? Oh, that red spot? Wait a minute. Thad, to the astonishment of the injured lad, whipped out a small magnifying glass, with which he was in the habit of examining beetles and all sorts of things of a like nature, in whose habits he, as an amateur naturalist, chanced to be interested. This he applied to the red mark, examining the same closely. I can see two sets of little punctures, one above and one below, he announced presently. That's them, exclaimed Step Hen. Oh, he jumped right at me and bit me all right. I was that scared I could hardly move. I hate snakes, you know, the worst kind. Dad, tell me, did anybody ever get bit by a rattler and live? My goodness, will you have to cut my leg off to save me? Oh, I think I'd rather die right now than have to hop around on one leg all my life. Do something for me, Thad. What are you grinning at, Giraffe? This is a mighty serious matter, I tell you. Keep still, said Thad sternly. Then he got down and sucked at the tiny wounds with all his might, having first made sure that he had no cut or abrasion of the skin about his lips or the interior of his mouth. Having expectorated freely, Thad got up again. Step Hen followed his every movement with a troubled look on his face. Think you got all the old poison out, Thad? Oh, let somebody else have a try, won't you? Can't afford to take any chances about this. Think what an awful blow it'd be to my folks if I skipped off right here and now. Catch me a jumping over a log again without first looking. Where's my gun? Did anybody see my gun? Goodness knows where it went. I bet that snake went and carried. Oh, thank you, Alan. There's the little dandy, all right. But, Thad, don't it look like my leg's beginning to swell? I just seem to feel it twitching all the time. Is that the poison going through my system? Oh, 
I just knew some day a measly old snake would get me. How I hate him. Keep still, commanded the scoutmaster sternly. Oh, all right, Thad. I'm sure you'll do the right thing by me. But it's just awful to know you've been bitten by a rattlesnake. In the first place, I don't believe it was a rattlesnake, said Thad positively. But it was an awful big, wicked-looking snake, Thad. And if you'd seen the way it jumped at me, began Step Hen. That's one of the reasons I had for saying what I did, Thad went on. A rattlesnake never attacks anyone or any enemy. It always throws itself into a coil, and with head erect and tail rattling a warning, don't tread on me, waits to be attacked. This rule has no exception. A rattlesnake is almost helpless out of coil, and the very first thing he does is to curl up. He may lunge so hard at something as to throw himself halfway out of coil, but as quick as a flash he's back again, for he's afraid something will get him. Oh, is that so, Thad? exclaimed Step Hen, still keeping one anxious eye on his bare leg, as though he half expected to see it begin to puff up visibly before his very eyes. Was this snake coiled when you first saw it? demanded Thad. No. no. What was it doing then, Step Hen? I reckon it was crawling along. Yes, I know it was, because I remember how I got a fierce jolt when I was just going over the log to see it with its old head raised and showing its teeth. And then it jumped at you, Thad continued, and tried to wrap around me after it bit me through my legging, but I guess I kicked some because it dropped off and ran away. Thad smiled. I'm sure now it was not a rattler, he said. No doubt it may have been a big black snake. They're as fierce as they make them, and can whip a sluggish rattler every time. But they're not poisonous at all, Step Hen. Oh, I hope then it was a black snake, exclaimed the other scout with a sigh. Another thing, said Thad, wishing to make it conclusive, so Step Hen might not keep on worrying about the affair. A black snake bites, but as a general rule, a rattlesnake opens his jaws until they stand almost perpendicular, so that he can lay bare his poison fangs. He sinks these two hollow teeth into his enemy with a furious blow, and at the same time injects the poison. There is no known sure remedy for a rattlesnake's poison, but this snake tried to bite you. There are the faint marks of teeth belonging to both the upper and the lower jaw. It's all right, Step Hen, you're in no danger. The poison would have begun to work before now, if it was there. But you won't take any chances, will you, Thad? asked the other. I didn't. I sucked just as hard as if I thought you were going to swell up and have your heart affected, said Thad. But to make sure, Thad, suppose you paint my leg with some of that purple stuff you carry with you, replied Step Hen. Oh, you mean that solution of permanganate of potash, replied the other. Yes, that's the stuff. But, objected Thad, it's meant for scratches from the claws of carnivorous animals, so as to neutralize the virus that is apt to get in the blood and give blood poisoning. Well, here's some poison it can get in its little work on, Step Hen insisted. But it will hurt like sixty. Let her hurt. The more the better, because then I know it'll be doing its work. Come, let's have it, Thad. Knowing how persistent Step Hen could be when he wanted to, the scoutmaster felt that he must comply with his request. It could do no harm, and at least would make the boy feel easier in his mind. Gee, don't it darken things up some, Step Hen declared, a little later when the application had been made. It stains a whole lot, admitted Thad. Huh, I've got one thing to be thankful for anyhow, Step Hen remarked. Lots of them, my boy, laughed Thad. But what do you mean in particular? I'm glad he pinched me on the leg, the other went on, whimsically. Think if he jumped up and dented my nose, and you had to paint it like that. My stars, maybe I wouldn't be a sight, though. 
you'd sure never have been able to go back to Cranford, declared Giraffe, who had been an interested observer of all that went on, because they'd all say you'd taken to drink. Huh, nothing funny about that, because I've been drinking all my life, the other answered back. Does it hurt? asked Thad. Well, I guess yes, replied Step Hen, making a grimace. But then I want it to just gouge me. Go it, you little gripper. Hope you counteract every drop of poison. That's it. Hit me up again. Woo, that's going some. Now there are two of us, remarked Giraffe, as he vied with Step Hen in seeing which could limp the most. It's your right leg and my left one, so we've still got a decent pair between us. But they ain't mates by a long shot, declared Step Hen. Joking in this way, they followed after Thad and Allen, but as the morning was nearly done, it was decided to make camp long enough to have a bite. Again, they talked to Bumpus and his affairs as they sat around the fire and ate. Step Hen hoped that the fat scout would not have the misfortune to run across a fighting snake, such as the one that had thrown him into such a panic. Because, you see, he went on, not knowing any better, the poor feller would think it was a rattler instead of just a plain everyday black snake. And it would give him no end of worry because he couldn't suck the wound himself, being no contortionist like Davy Jones, and he wouldn't have Thad and his little potash bottle handy. Yes, that's so, remarked Giraffe. There are some people who don't know the difference between a poisonous rattler with its square head and a long twisting black snake. Step Hen turned a little red in the face and laughed, but did not venture to take up Giraffe's stare, so that for once an argument that might have waxed fierce was avoided. Presently they were moving on again. Acting on the suggestion of Thad, the four scouts had formed a sort of fan formation, being within easy seeing and hearing distance of each other, but covering quite a wide stretch of ground. Allen and Thad had given it as their opinion although they admitted they could not be absolutely sure, that although they must certainly have covered fully thirty miles in their wanderings, they were not more than ten from the camp by the rapids. It fell to Giraffe to make a discovery this time. Along about two o'clock he raised his voice and gave an excited call, this being the signal to assemble. The other scouts hurried toward Giraffe, anxious to learn what he had to communicate. End of chapter 16Oakland, California. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter 17. More trouble ahead. What have you? asked Step Hen, who, strange to say, in spite of his lame leg, arrived just a little in advance of the other two. Giraffe was standing there twisting that long neck of his this way and that. He declined to say anything until Thad had arrived on the scene. Then, with an expressive pose, he pointed to the ground near his feet. What do you call that, huh? Tell me I ain't got the eye of an eagle. Somebody else might have gone stumping along and never seen it. But you can catch a weasel asleep as easy as you can fool me. It's a trail, all right, said Thad. Say, his trail, persisted Giraffe. Pumpus did make it, that's certain, Allen broke in with. And after the storm, too. No question about that, because the rain hasn't washed the marks at all, was the joyous declaration of Allen. See, cried Giraffe, if he had been wearing a vest, Step Hen really believed the proud, lengthy scout would have thrust his thumbs into the armholes and assumed a pose. 
as though about to have his picture taken as a serious rival to cooper's leather stocking the greatest of trail finders what luck step hen broke out with luck nothing flashed back giraffe refusing to be cheated out of any of his honors it's the reward of patient plodding work and using eyes and brain right along now if i'd been satisfied to limp along looking up at the sky and all around but never once on the ground like some people i know do d'ye suppose i'd ever run across this trail not much give old eagle eye his due step hen yes he deserves it said thad because this is a most important find it places us on top once more because now we've got something to work on added allan was this track made this morning asked step hen allan shook his head no he replied i don't think so but why shouldn't it be continued the other scout bound to know why you can see that the ground was still quite wet when he passed along here that wouldn't have been the case this morning for in twelve hours or more it must have dried out pretty well allan explained that's so i never thought of such an easy explanation step hen admitted oh there's a heap of things about this business we don't know said giraffe but it all sounds so mighty interesting i'm bound to learn right along they were following the new trail while exchanging remarks along this line one good thing about it thad went on to say we now know bumpus must have come through the storm all right however did he do it murmured giraffe perplexed because the tenderfoot was proving such a wonder three to one he found a hollow tree and crawled in grumbled step hen with the luck he's got why of course lightning never struck there while with me it was just sure to well remarked thad between you and me i don't believe bumpus would do that because we were talking of lightning only the other day he had an uncle who was killed that way when a tree was struck and bumpus said nobody would ever get him to take such chances i remember his asking me if it would be all right to crawl in a hollow log that lay flat on the ground and i told him yes so if he was able to find a log big enough to hold him i guess that's what he did giraffe gave a whistle there was a little trace of envy in his manner for giraffe was a boy and it did seem to him bumpus was developing along the lines of a scout altogether too fast i see your finish as patrol leader thad he remarked that bumpus has just waked up and there's no telling what he'll do i expect we'll all be kowtowing to him yet like he was a real chinese mandarin glad of it laughed thad and it would tickle me a lot i tell you if a few more scouts would take a notion to wake up well returned giraffe they may yet i know too that are digging knuckles into their eyes right at this minute and stretching and yawning like they just meant to stir out of their dope sleep hey step hen that's so giraffe bumpus has set us the pace i tell you came the reply what do you make of the trail allan the scoutmaster asked about this replied the tracker bumpus was leg weary about this time plenty to show it and i wouldn't be surprised if we came on his camp before long i've seen where he stepped out of his way looking for dry wood and then went on again as if not satisfied hooray for bumpus he's our pard exclaimed step hen glad to even bask in the reflected light of so much glory i wonder now 
giraffe remarked his thoughts naturally turning in the one direction was he able to make a fire lots of fellers that like to call themselves scouts wouldn't know how when every stick of wood was soaken wet after such a rain oh they ain't all such fire cranks as you've always been giraffe ventured step hen and i say it's good for the country they ain't i reckon the whole wood supply of the united states would have been used up by now if the rest of the scouts had their minds set like you but wait and see said thad i've got a notion that bumpus is going to surprise some of us a lot more fact is i believe he's just had his mind set on a hike like this for some time because he's been asking dozens of questions of me and setting the answers down in that little notebook of his till he half filled it was one of them about making a fire after a rain demanded giraffe just that replied thad you told him how to dig out the dry heart from the stump or a log to start his fire with didn't you thad explained it all fully answered the patrol leader oh if that's the case i just guess he will have made a fire it's easy once you've been shown how grumbled giraffe but you had to be told how once don't forget giraffe thad went on to say be generous now and remember that bumpus has had his outdoor education sadly neglected i'm glad he's showing new life and i hope it will keep right along i believe it will that's the beauty of this scout business once a boy gets a taste of these many things that call for self-reliance and thought he keeps on wanting to know more his appetite becomes enormous but the food supply in the shape of information really has no limit you understand i'm going in for it with all my heart and soul thad asserted giraffe more seriously than the patrol leader had known him to be for a long time me too echoed step hen it's a good thing to know how to save a feller's life if he gets near drowned cuts his foot with an axe gets shot by accident or else had the hard luck to run up against a mean rattler and you can count on me to help you all i'm able to said thad there are a lot of things i don't know myself allan here is teaching me a heap about following a trail and i'm enjoying it more than i can explain nothing like the practical experience after all the book taught scout is all very well but he has to change a lot of his ideas when he comes to see the same things really and truly done and some of them are so different from his notion that he can hardly recognize them what is it allan this last was directed toward the tracker who had suddenly shown evidences of excitement they saw him bend down and more closely examine the ground in front then he whistled and turned a face toward his chums on which they could plainly read new anxiety it beats anything how they could have just happened to cross the trail of bumpus he observed thad instantly jumped at conclusions meaning our old acquaintances hank dodge and pierre laporte he said here are their footprints as plain as anything continued allan look for yourselves because all of you know what they were like here's where hank rested the butt of his gun on the ground while he talked it over with pierre and yes he even emptied his pipe right at this place knocking it on his shoe because you can see some half-burned tobacco in this footprint do you think they knew who bumpus was asked thad they could guess easy enough after remembering what we said about our having a tenderfoot chum 
wandering around here by himself was the prompt reply of the trail finder but then it wasn't any of their business giraffe went on to say they might have had curiosity enough to figure out who bumpus was but they'd never seen him and so of course he hadn't done anything to injure them he looked troubled though even while thus trying to assure himself that bumpus could not be in any peril because of these two ugly timber cruisers but his chums had riled them up considerably allan went on and perhaps they were mean enough to think they could hit us through bumpus step hen ground his teeth in anger while his eyes flashed ominously did they change their course right here allan he asked just what they did was the reply and followed after our chum step hen went on you can see for yourself that their prince blot his out in places the other replied come on said step hen shaking his gun furiously End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 Of the Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Shasta Oakland, California. The Boy Scouts Through the Big Timber by Herbert Carter. Chapter 18. Still in pursuit with the trail growing warmer. Step Hen was not alone in feeling angry at this action on the part of the two unscrupulous timber cruisers. Every one of the scouts experienced a degree of indignation that might easily be fanned into boyish rage and i don't calculate now said giraffe presently that hank and pierre are the kind of men to step out of their way ten feet to do a good deed specially toward a boy they'd never yet seen well they didn't impress me that way declared thad and they haven't much of a reputation for being tender-hearted, I believe, Allan added, speaking over his shoulder, for he was following the trail persistently. But then, even a novice could have kept on that trail. None of the three who made it seemed to think anything about hiding their tracks. Those of Bumpus, in particular, were plainly marked, and presently giraffe began to notice this patent fact there seems to be a big difference in these footprints he said there certainly is allan replied now i don't mean it that way because of course bumpus hasn't got feet anywhere near as big as those of hank and pierre but always it's the same and his footprints look deeper than theirs but for all he's so fat sure bumpus can't be heavier than either of those big broad-shouldered husky men giraffe seemed to realize that there must be an explanation which would clear up this little mystery and he wanted it that isn't what makes the difference giraffe the tracker went on you know we decided that bumpus went along here right soon after the storm yesterday afternoon and while the ground was still soft yes i remember allan well said allan hank and pierre didn't happen on the scene until this morning and by then the ground was somewhat firm again is that plain enough i should say it was and thank you for the explanation giraffe answered it beats all what you fellers can get out of this thing why that alone is about as interesting a fact 
as anybody could think up. Then Bumpus had, say, twelve hours to start, suggested Step Hen. Right here, yes, replied Allen, but you must remember that he was meaning to settle down for the night about this time, and when he went on this morning, perhaps they'd be only a couple hours behind. Whew! Things seem to be getting mighty interesting, remarked Giraffe. I should say they were, Step Hen asserted. Don't I wish Davy and Smithy and Bob White were here, the long scout went on. Heh! <laughs> There's four of us as it is, and all carrying good guns, too. We ought to be enough of a crowd to hold up that pair of cowards, declared Step Hen, who did not seem to have a very high opinion of Hank and his mate. We did it once all right, remarked Giraffe, with a grin, and we can do it again, or my name is Dennis. But Bumpus hadn't camped yet, had he? step hen asked i think we're coming to where he spent last night said allan i had a glimpse just then of something that looked like a dead campfire yes here it is boys you see well he did do it all right muttered giraffe as he stood there and looked down upon the ashes of a fire yes thad remarked and here we can see where he obtained dry timber by hacking into the heart of this stump. Oh, Bumpus is the surprise of this trip, all right, exclaimed Step Hen. I'm just going to take off my hat to him after what he's done. He seems to keep us guessing, don't he? Thad remarked, looking around with a feeling akin to pride to realize that the one who all along had been termed the real tenderfoot of the patrol should so suddenly develop such astonishing skill in taking care of himself. No babes in the woods about this business, let me tell you, asserted Giraffe, after he had examined the way Bumpus had made his fire, done things pretty near as well as an old seasoned fire builder could have made out that was a high compliment indeed coming from giraffe bumpus must have felt greatly pleased could he have heard it perhaps his right ear burned him just about that time for all the boys know that such a thing happens only when someone is making complimentary remarks about you but bumpus left here this morning of course said step hen and allan went on he did after passing a pretty comfortable night on that bed of hemlock boughs which he made and which you can see there kept his feet toward the fire too just like an old experienced camper who was without a tent and blanket would do and his going off without this last is what convinces me bumpus didn't really mean to lose himself when he started out to get his bear he just took a lot of grub along his hatchet and plenty of ammunition so as to be pretty well fixed in case he couldn't make use of his compass in finding the way back to camp giraffe placed his hand on the dead ashes wet em down again sure he did he remarked ain't our chum just it though chuckled step hen he kept his fire burning all night thad remarked casually how do you know that asked step hen oh the amount of ashes tells that he used a heap of wood was the reply you can see he made his camp close to this fallen tree and used his little axe in cutting up the dead branches. Bumpus deserved to be made a first-class scout, said Giraffe, in genuine enthusiasm. He's on the road there, anyhow, declared Allan. But we must be off, Thad remarked. 
we've had a few minutes rest while figuring out all these things our chum has been up to now let's put our best leg forward that means the right one said giraffe no you're away off there it's the left one remonstrated step hen limping more decidedly with his right leg to prove that it was not in the running both of you are correct declared thad it all depends on the point of view you choose to take and of course hank and company started out on the new trail because i can see the marks of their brogans ventured giraffe yes allan replied they looked around the camp a bit perhaps surprised to find that even a tenderfoot scout knows how to take care of himself then they pushed on how far behind bumpus i should say about three hours replied the trail master without hesitation he's got that much lead then giraffe asked close on it allan answered but something may cause him to stop and then they'd overtake him on the whole i'd rather guess those men would make faster time than our chum and be slowly but surely gaining all the while suggested that yes then we've got to get a hustle on us that's all giraffe asserted already we're away behind in the race and just as like as not another night's going to catch us before we overhaul these parties that'll make it bad we can't help it any remarked thad we're doing our level best and there's a limit you know we just got to leave the rest to providence and bumpus luck don't forget that said step hen he sure got it along with him this trip giraffe avowed and it's been working overtime for our fat chum too seems to me these here gents are kind of rash trying to meddle with a feller that has everything coming to him like bumpus has perhaps they'll think they have made a mistake when they tackle that walkin wonder both giraffe and step hen chuckled a little as though the idea rather appealed to their boyish sense of humor and thad could not help thinking things had come to a strange pass indeed when these two scouts who had lorded over bumpus so long on account of their superior knowledge were ready to admit that they might yet sit at the feet of the fat chum and take lessons in woodcraft would wonders ever cease thad thought but then he knew only too well that once a scout becomes fully enthused with zeal in the pursuit of knowledge along these lines he will not only open up new pleasures daily for himself but surprises for his friends as well they had been gone from the campfire about half an hour now there was no trouble at all about following the trail indeed allan more than once declared that even if a bandage were tied over his eyes he would have been able to keep right along using his fingers to guide him so plainly marked were the footprints of men and boy hello said allan suddenly i wonder now what started him to running bumpus you mean don't you asked giraffe yes he began right here you can see how his toes pressed down allan remarked perhaps he discovered the men behind him suggested step hen no they were still more than two hours back allan contrived as he walked on hastily and besides bumpus never once turned to look behind i could tell from his track if he did something in front must have attracted him giraffe and step hen looked at each other i wonder said the former twould be just bumpus luck if he did the other boy exclaimed 
neither of them spoke their thoughts aloud further than that for a short time they kept moving rapidly along and then alan held up his hand as a signal for the others to stop well he said it happened after all these days of tramping bumpus came across the trail of a bear and a big fellow too see here you can see his tracks where none of the others have marred them end of chapter eighteen